scripture memory verse tonight, Colossians 3, 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Colossians 3, 1. Anybody else? Okay, Colossians 3, 1. If then you were raised with Christ, which seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Colossians 3. Good job. Anybody else? Colossians 3, 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Good job. Anybody else? Anybody else? church in Colossae and really they call Ephesians and Colossians uh, the twin epistles they were what were called circular letters they would be they were written and then they were passed around and uh, uh, usually they were read to the people that's something that you have to understand a lot of people could not uh, read uh, in this culture so the word was read to them a lot of times and uh, that's a very important thing because faith comes by hearing and hear it by the word of God. And so when somebody reads it to you, you hear it with the intent to do it. And we know that that's Romans 10, 17. But this book was written around A.D. 60. And uh, Paul writes to them. And this is our memory verse. If then you were raised with Christ. And, and we said and we said, well, when, when was we raised with Christ? Well, we're in Christ. And when we're in Christ, then supernaturally while you're in Christ... You receive everything that is Christ as an inheritance. So we were raised with him. And what, what you really pick back up on, it, I think it's 2.12. But let's look at, just back up a page in your Bible. Maybe maybe it's on the same page. 2.11 is where we can start at. He actually already mentioned us about being raised. Uh, and so that's why he's saying since or if then. Or this one can this one could be uh, uh, um, weather, or for as much as you were raised with. It's a conjunction. Uh, you were risen. It be risen is the King James to raise together from the dead to life with Christ, and and it's to rouse from death. So of course, our old nature. We're born dead, and so when we believe in Christ, we're raised to the dead. We're raised to, to life again, uh, and that's. That's exactly what he's talking about. But he says in 11, in him you were also, now notice when it says in him, you, it's talking about you. It's talking about every person that believes in Jesus Christ. And we have to get this straight because there's, there's, there's identity, there's positions, and then there's practical walk in sanctification. And so this is part of our identity. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then it says, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And so that's what he's talking about is that, and this can be, this can be a, I'm going to be careful with it. I think he's talking about water baptism. 
but he can also be talking about spiritual baptism. When, your spirit, when you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. And so you're spiritually baptized into the body of Christ. Now your identity is, is that you're hidden in Christ. And now since you're in Christ and Christ died, we all died. He actually says this uh, over in, let's just look at 2 Corinthians 5. And, and, and uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's not something that we're going, okay, they did, so we did, we will. This is your position, or excuse me, this is your identity in Christ. 2 Corinthians is going to be backing up in your Bible. Chapter 5, we hear all the time. Uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Um, and it, we have to understand it. See, our position is we're spotless and clean. But, but, but our identity is our inheritance. It's part of what we've inherited. Uh, and we've inherited this. And he says this, for we do not... Did I say where to go? 512? 513? Where am I going? 514. Let's go to 514. I, I, I don't want to, I mean, when I read the other stuff, it kind of confuses the point. Uh, and if you need context, you can read it later. 514 says this, For the love of Christ compels us, constrains us, because we judge thus, if one died for all, then all died. This is how we're judging now. This is what we're saying. Because if Christ died for all, then we all died in him when we're baptized into the body of Christ. Whether it's either our obedience and we go out and we get baptized in water, or whether it's the spiritual baptism, uh, I believe it's probably the spiritual baptism into the body of Christ, and now you become identified with him from that spiritual aspect. But water baptism is also an identification where you we go down in a watery grave and we'll go look at that in a minute too because i want you guys to see it uh, so if one died all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again and so we have the same thing even if we can't comprehend the fact that in Christ we're all dead to ourselves and we're now living for others in the one another ministry where we, we now are living to be witnesses only. Just as Christ came to obey the Father, we now come to do thy will the same way. We're supposed to be doing the Father's will. And, and, and the beauty is, is when we fail, our sin has already been paid for. The beauty is, is that this is not a pass or fail. This is a, if we sin and we blow it and we don't complete it, then Christ already paid for every bit of it, but we don't go on in sin. And that again is back in Romans 6. And let's go look at Romans 6. I just want to hit this for a minute. The bigger topic is what should we be doing? How should we be setting our affections? What should, they, what should we be looking at? That's the bulk of this verse. But I want to take you to a few places where, where Paul is really talking about the same thing over and over. We, in our last study, I think we were in Romans 6 and we read it. Uh, I just want you to see it. He dealt with it from, three to, from chapter 3, uh, 23, all the way up to chapter 5. He's dealing with all of us being confined to sin. And then, uh, of course, Christ sets us free. Uh, from sin it's uh, uh, the free gift six, uh, 623 is that right yes so 6 1 Romans 6 1 what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound certainly not how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it now listen, these are, these are statements of identity. When we believe in Christ, he gives us life. We're no longer living dead. We're no longer living the death anymore. We're living a new life. But watch and keep going. And verse 2 is what I wanted to get you to, or 3 I wanted to get you to also. Or do you not know? It's a great statement. Do you not know? Do you know your identity? Do you, are you learning? Are you growing? Are, are you seeking to find what's going on in the body of Christ? Well, I, you know, I just believed in Jesus. I said that prayer. I went before the altar, and they said, if you say this prayer, you're saved. Well, shouldn't you find out what's going on in your identity, in your, in your inheritance? Shouldn't you find out what you're supposed to do now that you're a new creation in Christ? 
So he says, or do you not know that as many as as many of us as were baptized, it's baptismo, it means to be uh, overwhelmed or whelmed completely, into Christ Jesus, uh, notice it wasn't Jesus Christ, because it's afterwards. And so Christ is the most of the Mashiach, him being the anointed of God is more important than his first name, which is God is salvation. And so they, they, they often that's what Paul would do is put Christ before. Before he dies, it's Jesus Christ. After he dies, it's Christ Jesus because him giving his life as the Messiah is, is more important than his first name, Jesus, which means the Lord is salvation. So as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Now, once again, I believe this is talking about water baptism here, but it can also be the baptism of the Spirit into the body of Christ. And he talks about that in chapter 8, where by the Spirit which we cry, Abba, Father, when we're baptized into the, when you believe. He talks about it in Ephesians 1.13. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so that's the baptism into the body of Christ that we all get baptized into. But then when you're baptized in water, and this is what I believe this is, it's into his death. That's a watery grave. You go down in the water because you're showing people what God's doing on the inside of your heart. And you go down in the water, and as you raise back up, it's, it's, it's signifying you coming up out of the grave. That you're dying to who you are, and now you're entering into this life where you're going to obey God where you want to learn to obey God. You want to know what you're supposed to be doing. You want to understand your gifts and talents and abilities. And you begin to, again, in his house, follow him the way Adam and Eve were when they walked with him daily in the garden. So now we want to have that same relationship that was interrupted by sin. And since one sin, all sin, he just said that in Romans 5, and, and, and since death came by the one who sinned, then now life can come to the one who did not sin. And he gives us that life. And that's, that's, that's uh, paraphrasing chapter 5. Um, yeah, we've been given that life. And, 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 you, and, and so that's pretty amazing. For Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Pay attention. This is the resurrection they're talking about. Even so, this is a comparison, we also should walk in the newness of life. Now, what is that? See, Jesus is evidence that, that he, was, he was raised out of the grave for us is the resurrection that we preach about. Now, the evidence of us actually uh, 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 rising and, and becoming new is, is that we walk in the newness of life. Not the newness of death or the oldness of death. We don't continue doing what we used to do, but there's a newness because now we have life. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's a new and living way that we're supposed to be walking in. And that's the proof. That becomes the evidence. Listen, many people will say, well, you're not saved by work, so, so I, I'm not saved by my walk. No, but it's proof that you do have a walk, that you have a walk in this life and that you're not still living death. And so even, even James says, uh, faith without works is dead faith. So we're not saved by works, but just like our last verse said, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So it, it's not that we, oh, I'm doing all these works to get saved. It's not that we're doing all these works because we want to stay saved. It's because God has given us a new life. From the old life was death. He's given us a new life, and we should want to obey. We should desire to follow. And the only way you can do that is by the Spirit of God. See, under the law, there was no power to do it. Under the law, the law just said, you're a sinner. The law pointed it out and pointed out the, the, the very need that we needed Jesus because we could not perform the law. But then Jesus comes, and under grace, what are we given? We're given the Holy Spirit. We're given the power to walk in the newness of life. We're given the identity that we are dead to self and now to live for Christ. We're given the position that the power and the penalty of sin has been taken. And if we're going to walk in the newness of life, we're going to let God take the pleasure and the practice of sin from us. So that one day we can be glorified uh, just as Jesus already has been. 
And, and the beauty of it is, is it's because we are in Christ. We are hidden in Christ. He's getting ready to talk about this in Colossians. But let me just finish uh, in Romans 6. I hope I'm not going too fast for you guys. 6, 5. For if, that's a big word right there. We have been united together in the likeness of his death. Which again, that's, that's, that's where we're, we're seeing our identity at. Uh, when we believe we're in Him, supernaturally, we literally, we're not, we're not just making it up. We're not just saying, oh, I just think that I'm dead. We supernaturally go back to that grave with Him, somehow with our spirit. And we're saying, as we believe in Him, that we are dead with Him. That we died with Him. If one died, then all died. That becomes our identity. It's not, it's not a, it, I mean, it's not something you can go, well, I just kind of reckon the old man dead. That's not what that word means. We're going to get to it in a second. It's actually who you are if you believe in Jesus. The old body of sin is dead. The old nature is dead. It's a, and the only way it can be alive is if you feed it. If you feed it, you bring it back to life. But if you walk in the newness of life and you stay focused on Jesus instead of feeding the old life, because when you feed the old life, it can keep running around and, and, and lead you around by your nose. But it's supposed to be dead. When you know that it's dead and it has no power over you, you don't feed it. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, some, it's some old woman, it means your old nature. They're using the word man, but it's the old nature, your sin nature, was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin, totally free. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. He's alive for eternity. He's alive forever. And so, so are we. We are alive forever. We, we, to no more die uh, except to self. Uh, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Now we can ask ourselves, is the life that we're living because he died for our sin, are we living a life to God? See, this is the newness of life, living a life for God. Now, what are, this is what we're going to start talking about over in Colossians 3. What are we? What are we living our life to? He lives to God. Um, likewise, you also, verse eleven, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. In is the very important word. In Christ, that's where we get our oxygen from. That's where we get our power from. That's where we get our identity from. That's where we find our death at, our our position at, our place at. Everything is in Christ. Jesus our Lord. And the word uh, reckon uh, it means to take an inventory. To take an inventory and to, and to conclude and to reason. Uh, it's, not, it's not just where you're trying to, it means because some people try to say, well you got to reckon the old man dead and just say you're dead. No, no, it's your identity already. It's given. The power of the Holy Spirit is there. You're dead because you're alive now to Christ. And so you reason uh, uh, with God and reason in your identity that you are indeed dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it, that you should obey it in its lust. Listen, don't let it. This is an act of our will. We want Christ to reign. We don't want sin, any type of sin, to reign in our mortal bodies. Didn't I have something about mortal body? No. That you should obey its laws. 13. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, because we were resurrected with him. So you want to be a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It do, but, but present yourself being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Once again, under law, sin, sin had dominion because there was no power to accomplish it. There was nothing in us that could keep us from sinning because our very nature was a sin nature. And the very thing that we do by nature was to sin. It, it, it just, there was no power there. There was the thing I wanted to do, I, 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 I couldn't do. And the thing I didn't want to do, I did, is what Paul said. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? God has saved us. Because we have to understand that we are now dead with him. And we rose in the newness of life. He rose in the resurrection. And that's why we're looking for him. Why were we looking at? We're seeking those things which are above where Christ is. Well, where is Christ? He's sitting at the right hand of God. Well, what's he doing? He's praying. Okay, we know that. He's given us a full inheritance of all the heavenly things. But we know that he's making uh, uh, intercession for us right now. Let's go back to, to chapter 3. I, I, it's hard to go into Romans uh, anywhere because you get trapped in the, in the verse. And, and, and sometimes it doesn't have the context that you would like for it to have. Um, but you get caught in there and you go, I've got to read the 25, chapter, or 25 verses here just to go over and make one little small point. But that's, where am I at? There we go, Colossians 3, 1. So, if then you were raised with Christ. Listen, if you believe in Jesus, and, and some people translate this since, instead of if then, it's since. Because if you're a believer, and he's writing believers to the church in Colossae, it's since you were raised. What does it say in there? I think it's if be risen, if be risen, uh, King James, I don't have it in front of me. If you be risen uh, with Christ, then what should you do? So now if you understand your identity and you, you, you died with Christ, and now you're to walk in the newness of life, then what should we do? The very first thing it says is seek. Seek what? Those things which are above. Above where? Where Christ is sitting. And it's pretty simple. He's sitting at the right hand of God. He's sitting in the, the seat of power. And all of this has to be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, under the law, where we just closed in Romans there, under the law, you had no power. But it pointed out that you're a sinner, and you better do it. And then when you couldn't do it, it showed you condemnation and death. And that's why you look forward and you go, oh, Jesus is going to die for me. There's going to be a Messiah. There's going to be a provision. And so in the Old Testament, uh, because of their sin, they did what was called a kofar. And that's when they would bring the animals. They would bring the sacrifice. It might have been a wave offering. It might have been you know, a drink offering, whatever they were bringing. And, and it was a covering for their sin. But then Jesus comes. It all looked forward to Jesus. Jesus comes, uh, the Lamb of God, and, and he gives his life once for all. He dies once for all and to take away the sins of the world. Not to cover them, not to cover them, but to take them away. Completely remove them from us that are in Christ Jesus. And so since we were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. They're in heaven. You know, in Matthew uh, 6.33, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things shall be added to you. And it's where our heart has to be. Is that You have to put God first in all these things. Seek those things which are above. And I, I would say to you, what are you seeking in life? What are you seeking daily? Many times, you know, we, we're still living in the world and we're still seeking to get the most toys. We're still seeking to keep up with the Joneses. We're still seeking to do the same thing that everybody else in the world is doing instead of getting our marching orders from God. We're still seeking the very same thing that the American dream tells us to seek. We're seeking the very same thing that our parents might have told us to seek if they were in the church. But are you seeking things that are above? Are you seeking the things which are above? Seek is this. Listen, it means to desire. 
to inquire, to be about. In a Hebraism, it means to worship. It means to worship. That those things that are upward, they're in a higher place. And they tell us where Christ is at again too. Paul does right there. Sitting at the right hand of God. And then in verse 2, let's just keep moving. I want to do a little bit more of this. Uh, first, what are you seeking in life? Because we're, listen, and it's so hard because our flesh gets, you come to Jesus and you say, okay, now I believe in Jesus. Well, now you need to walk in the newness of life like we read over in Romans 6. The newness of life. But, but most Christians come and they say a prayer and then they walk off and they're still pursuing the very same thing. But I was told that I could be this in life. And if I did this and I worked hard, I could, I could live the American dream and I could be anything I wanted to be. But what did God call you to be? What did God create you for? What's the gifts and talents and abilities that God has given you? What are you supposed to be doing by the power of the Holy Spirit? And you have to seek the throne room. You have to seek Jesus' face. You have to seek him in order to find out what you're supposed to be doing. And man can't tell you. You know, a lot of times pastors will say that, that we're talent scouts. We watch people. We see their gifting. We can help them understand their gifting. Listen, I believe Jesus needs to tell you what your gifting is. And you will know it. You will understand it. You will love doing it. You, you, you know, you, 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 you have to get out of the way. It's really hard even as a, as a teacher, as, as a worker for God. That you, you do your works so people will notice you. Listen, if you read your Bible, if you do the scripture memory verse because you want people to notice you, this is a fleshly work and God doesn't recognize flesh. We're memorizing scripture to wash our mind. We're memorizing scripture to share it with other people so that when they hear scripture, they can come to salvation. They can become hungry. We're growing. This is part of growing is putting on the word of God to cover our mind and, and protect ourselves. But you can actually be in the kingdom of God living for Jesus and everything that you do, all your works be burnt up when you get to heaven because you do them for the selfish motives. Do them for the wrong reason. Instead of being, wanting to be sanctified and to seek those things that are in heaven and seek those things which are above, we do them so that people will notice us. You know that you can learn all these scriptures. We can learn all the Bible. And the Bible, I mean, it says if we do it for the wrong reasons, knowledge puffs up. You see, we're supposed to be bowing down. Knowledge just puffs up. Look what I know. Look what I did. Look what I can be. You know, and, and we begin to, to flaunt the scripture like we know something and that other people don't. And we can take power over them and dominion over them. And that's what, that's what the, the flesh always wants to do. That's what the enemy always wants to do. But we're, we're learning scripture first to sanctify and cleanse ourselves so that we're worshiping God properly. But then secondly, to you, that God can bring it up out of our heart and use it to minister to other people so that they can come to salvation or others can be discipled and become more like Christ as they see us walking it out. But it's the newness of life we should be walking in by the power of the Holy Spirit as we seek his face and stop seeking the things of this earth. Look, we're going to go on. Let's keep moving. Uh, verse 2. Set your affections. It says set your mind. King James is set your affections. Uh, and it means to be mentally disposed earnestly in a certain direction. To interest oneself in with concern or obedience. So we're not just, we're not just saying, oh, I'm going to set my mind on things above. It's the same above. It's where Jesus is setting. I'm not just setting my mind on them to find out. Let me see what's going on in heaven. Let me see what God wants to do in my life. Let me see what God's doing in the church. But it's with the concern to obey it. We want to learn to obey it. We find out truth because look, uh, uh, the demons believe and they tremble. Uh, many believe and they don't, they don't do the works of the ministry. And, and, and that faith is a dead faith. James again says, faith without works is dead faith. It's not faith at all. It's not faith at all. And many people say they believe in God. They say they have faith, but they have no works to back it up. So they're not walking in the newness of life. They're not doing the works that God created in them uh, beforehand that they should walk in them. And so many people just go, I believe in Jesus. Or, you know, are you reading your Bible? 
and really seriously set your mind, set your affections uh, on things above. Are, are, do you have do you have what we call me and Michael was talking about this yesterday? Uh, devotional life. Do you have a devotional life? Do you do devotions? And, and, and it means being devoted to worship God. And I don't mean them little devotional books. So they, as, as far as I'm concerned, you can take every one of them little devotional books and throw them in the garbage. Because you're letting somebody else tell you what to believe. They are interpreting that. If you want to have a devotional life, you should be praying and reading your Bible before God and talking to God. I'm, I'm not saying that every... Every person that writes a devotional is bad. What I'm saying is, is that I want to hear from God. I don't want to hear regurgitated truth from somebody that writes down a little prayer and a little understanding of a text for me. It's just like reading a commentary is all you're doing. My little daily devotional. Now, lots of people have used them for years. They're not going to hell. But if you do you want to hear from somebody else every morning or do you want to hear from God every morning? And if you want to hear from God every morning... Open the Bible up, get into the Word of God, and pray with Him, and talk with Him. Just like we're having a conversation with anybody else in life, you have to talk with them to become intimate and, and, and have a relationship with them. And so you have to do that with God. And so I just don't like that you open up a book that somebody else has written and tells you what a scripture meant when you really need to know what God is saying to you. What are you saying to me? My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Following commentaries, following devotional books, following other voices is just like turning on the news and following what the talking head media is telling you to do. You want to hear what God is saying to the church today. It's a living word. It's a living relationship. It's the newness of life. And so you have to set your affections your mind, isn't it your mind that's being renewed? It is it your affections? This is all talking about sanctification. Your affections, your desires are all being renewed by God. So he says, set your mind on that which is above in heavenly places. Uh, that, that's that's um, the priorities of heaven. Think about that. If you're setting your mind on things that are in heaven... Set your minds on things above, not things on the earth. What's the priorities of heaven? I always say that he, God gave his most prized possession, his only begotten son, for what? To save souls. So the priorities of heaven is saving souls. Because God thought, I'm going to give my only begotten son, my greatest treasure, to do what? To buy back souls from the slave market of sin, from bondage. And so that's the priority of heaven. So everything that we're doing as we seek the face of God, as we seek the place of God and understand our position in Christ, which is where that, that was where that was first used there, wasn't it? I don't know if I get some notes. Um, anyway, what are you seeking? Are you seeking those things that are above? I mean, it's impossible to understand what's going on in life and in, in your Christian walk, in your relationship where you're betrothed to Christ, uh, and unless you're seeking His face in the word, prayer, and fellowship, setting your mind, your affections uh, upon things that are above, heavenly things, and not on the earth or this world, this inhabited world. Uh, listen, it's real simple. Don't do what they do. Set your eyes on things that are above. Set your affections on things that are above and not things on the earth. They're living for flesh. They're living for whoever gets the most. They're living to chase the next thing and to chase this and to chase that. And I got to have that new phone and I got to have that new this. And I got. They're chasing entertainment. They're chasing all of the amusement parks and the music and, and the clothing and the dress and everything that's going on. They're chasing it all to look like the world. In fact, it, it drives me crazy actually that even Christians want to dress like uh, uh, Hollywood stars. Want, want to talk about them and want to, to raise them up like they're somebody important. 
They're not somebody important. They're somebody that the devil and his minions have taken and made them into some type of a star. Well, there's fallen stars that are the demons. And I'm not picking on any of those people, but they could care less about you. All they want is to make their money. All they want is to make their movie, and they play a part. And, and, so, and then we begin to act like they're somebody important. Those people are lifted up in the physical realm of this world for you to worship them, to put your affection upon them, to desire their albums, to desire their books, to chase after their, their, the way they dress and their culture. And God says, get your eyes off, get your affections off of the things of this earth and get them on heavenly things. Get them on things that, where the Spirit of God can use your life for the glory of God. And that has to be as you get into the word prayer and fellowship, you confess your sin and you begin to find out what you're supposed to be doing, how you walk in the newness of life, and you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. You allow as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. So it has to be the Spirit of God, not that I'm chasing this or I'm chasing that or I can't wait till I get to this place and I'm saving for this and I'm going to get that and this is going to complete me. Only Jesus can complete us. And he already has a plan in how to do it. He already has a plan in how to do it. And we'll keep talking about it here. Uh, why do we want to set... I mean, how do I... How do I... Uh, uh, let me get back to this. How do I seek those things which are above? Verse 2 tells you, set your mind. Set your affections. That's how you seek those things which are above. When you begin to turn your heart toward home. You begin to set your affections on the things that you know are up there. That he's got hidden. It's hidden in Christ Jesus for you. And then notice this. Uh, he tells us why. Verse 3. For you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Notice he's in God. Christ is in God. And we're in Christ. What a protection. What a protection. Listen. For your life is covered. That word means covered. It was first used. This is a great word. Where is it at? Where was that first use? First usage of the word hidden is it's the word crypto. Is hid is the word crypto. It means to conceal by a covering. And so uh, God has covered us because that's what it's all about is a covering. That's what marriage is about is a covering. That's what life is about is a covering. Who is going to be your covering? He is our sacrifice. He's our covering. He's our husbandman. We are betrothed to him. Uh, first use is in Matthew 5, 14. And it's very good. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be covered, cannot be hidden. That's that word covered. When you read that in, in Matthew 5, 14, it cannot be covered. It, the true light cannot be covered up. You have to let it shine. They sing about it as kids. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You can't cover it up underneath the peck bush. You can't hide it. So your life is hidden in Christ, in God. Isn't that amazing? You died and your life is hidden. This is not ours anymore. We've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus. This is not my life anymore. <coughs> I've been bought. From the slave market by the blood of Jesus. Not with gold and silver, but by the precious blood of Jesus. He bought me. And, and, and now I'm supposed to be serving him. Surrendering to him. Freely and privileged to because he bought me from hell. I was on my way to hell. What an amazing thing. Look at four. When Christ, who is our life. Notice, he took our death. He is our life. Appears, is manifest then you will also appear with him in glory. That's pretty amazing. See, I think it's a positional statement here. It's, it's, it's the other ones are identity. This is positional. But how do we appear? How do we appear with him unless he takes us home first? How, when he comes, it's somebody's second coming. When he comes, we'll appear with him. But he is also... As we listen and as we sit, set our affections, as we seek him, as we begin to follow him, being led by the Holy Spirit, he's actually transforming us into his image. 
from glory to glory. He's making us just like him. And that's what the bride should be doing, is following, obeying. And we should be listening and hearing his voice and knowing that he come to save us. And he says in verse 5, Therefore, because of 1, 2, 3, and 4, therefore, that's what it's there for, put to death your members which are on the earth. Put to death. They're in the grave. You're already dead, and you've risen, but you have to make a choice to put them to death because you can keep living like that. You can keep chasing whatever you were doing. You, instead of walking in the newness of life, you can keep walking in the oldness of death if you choose not to obey. Therefore, put to death your members. Actually, members, it was the first member was an eye. If you're... If you're um, If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Uh, it's better to enter into heaven with, with one eye than to, to, to go to hell with both of them. Uh, so you, if your eye is making you offend, deal with it. Deal with the sin. Deal with the problem. Come to Jesus. The only, way, the only power there is to deal with sin is to focus upon Jesus, to turn to Jesus, to confess it to Jesus, to bow down to Jesus. And he, and he is the one that's already paid for it. And then he reveals your identity to you that it's already been dealt with. That you're already dead. And then you have to begin to walk that out by focusing on him, worshiping him, seeking him, understanding that this is not our home, but we live in heaven. But it has to be done once again by the Spirit of God. That's the power. So put to death, well, uh, what are they? What, what will they look like? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, and they're all idol idolatry. They're all idolatry because we put something else before what we're supposed to be seeking, Christ. Because, this is verse 6, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Now, now listen. The inference here is, is that we're children of obedience. That's the wrath of God. We're not appointed for wrath. The wrath is coming upon the children of disobedience, the sons of disobedience. But we are the children now who said, we believe in you, Jesus. Thank you for paying for our sins. We want to be obedient children, led by your spirit. And, and we're not doing the same thing anymore. Fornication, which is, it means it's pornea. It's sex outside, any type of sexual contact outside of a marriage bed. Uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is greed. Some people say, well, I'm not covetous. Yes, yes, we are. We all want stuff and we have to die. That's, 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 that's the base of all sin is wanting and coveting and wanting what the other people have. And say, how come they have and I don't? And that's how he uses that physical eye to make us desire. And we have to be content with all things. The only, the only remedy to covetousness is surrender and be content where God has us, the place that he has us. Contentness, godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, so we're supposed to be children of obedience. Verse 7, in which you yourselves once walked, that's how we once lived in the death, when you lived in them, that's how we lived. Now we're living in the newness of life. Now we're looking to the newness, the freshness that God give us new life when he breathed into us. But now you yourselves, this is a new beginning here. He just defined everything. But now you yourself are to put off all these. Now we just entered the dressing room of God's, uh, uh, God's house. This is, a, this is like stepping into the bathroom and he's going to tell us to take off and then put on. These are choices we have to make. As, as, he gives, as, we're seeking, as we're seeking the throne room, as we're seeking his face, as we're setting our affections on what he wants to do, he's saying these are bad, these are wrong, this is the old sin nature, this is death, and you need to put off these. Listen, don't, don't let anybody tell you that it's okay to be angry. I know the Bible says be angry and sin not, but most of our fleshly anger is sin. 
I'm not going to say 100% of it. There's sometimes we can have some what's called a righteous indignation where we can be angry righteously. But the Bible clearly says be angry and do not sin. So uh, put off. It's taking off. Put off means to cast off and to lay down, to put away. Uh, in Romans 13, 12, it says, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And, and this is what we have to do. We have to say no to self and yes to God. Taking off who we were and putting on the newness of life. And in James 1, 21, he says, Therefore, lay aside, put off all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word. How do we put on anything? It's the word of God. That's, the, that's what God sent to heal the land. was his word. He sent in the living word, Jesus Christ. And then look at, uh, quickly, put off, look at uh, Hebrews 12.1. Again, we have the same thing. I didn't write it down. I thought we would just look at it. It's right after 11. That's profound. But Hebrews 11 is the Hall of Faith chapter. So only by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit can we cast off anything. Listen, people think they can just stop doing something. You can't stop doing something. God shows you your sin, and he shows you that you got something on you that needs to come off your face. And then you say, oh, well, well, okay, I'll do that. And then you do it, but then you put it right back on there. The only way to do it is to ask the Holy Spirit as you humble yourself and say, I confess, Lord. I confess that I desire that. I like that. I want to follow that. Will you take those affections away from me as you seek his face in heaven? You're seeking his face. You're seeking where he's set at. And he says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that's talking about the Old Testament saints, let us lay aside, this is put off, every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking, what are we doing? We're, we're looking up, looking up where Jesus is seated, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despising the shame and has set, endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's our second witness that that's where he's at. That's where we're supposed to be looking. But what did he do? He, he laid aside, he put off the weight. See, weight can be things that you have in your life that you like to do that are not necessarily sin, but they're not seeking God. They can be all the pleasure. They can be the entertainment. They can be the things that, yeah, that's probably uh, not immoral. That's probably amoral. But look what it's doing. It's still in all of your time so that you're not reading the Word. You're not in fellowship. You're out on the boat, and that's not going to send you to hell. But it's Sunday, and you should be in church and in fellowship. So it's not immoral. But it's something that's a weight that would keep you from laying aside your sin and putting down your sin because you're not growing. And you should always be growing. And so that's why he says weight and the sin, look at it, which so easily ensnares us. It entraps us because you do it once. You eat one Lay's potato chip and you can't just eat one. You have to eat the whole bag. And so you, you go, oh, I'll just do it one more time. And then all of a sudden you're in bondage because it takes you back. It, it takes you and your heart goes, oh, those affections were fun. And sin is good for a season, but it always ends back at death. But walking in the newness of life, so he says in our text, 3, 8, you put off, lay aside. Lay aside. Isn't it funny that James says it's an overflow of filthiness and it's an overflow of wickedness that's in our hearts. I'm not that bad. Yes, you are. I mean, yes, I am. Uh, we think I'm not as bad as them. Uh, only by the grace of God did you not do what they did. Because that's what the devil wants for all of us. And that's what our sin nature would go to if we weren't. So he says this in verse 8. And he, and he starts to name them. Put off. These are things we have to take off. I can't get rid of my anger. I, get, I, I have wrath. I just get, well, wait a minute. You have to confess it first. 
when you start making excuses, I had somebody tell me the other day that, well, I think I'm allowed to because I, it's righteous in the, I think I can get angry and, I, and, and the prophets were angry and this was angry. Well, first of all, the Bible clearly says in Colossians 3, 8, put off anger. It said, clearly says that. So I don't care what the, the prophets were doing or what somebody else did or that Moses was a, 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 you know, a, 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 a little bit cantankerous with all the sheep. That doesn't matter. God's telling us right here in his word to put it off. To put it off. Put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. And then he says, do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old nature, the old man, the sin nature with its deeds, with its work, because now we're doing the work of God, and have put on the new nature who is renewed in knowledge, coming to know God according to the image of him who created him. According to the image of God. Jesus is the express image of God. He was God in the flesh. He's the express image in everything that he did. And that's why when they say he was angry, Jesus was not angry. When he took a whip and scourged the temple and chased them up out of there. It was zeal. The Bible clearly defines it for us. Zeal for my father's house has eaten me up. He wasn't angry. Yeah, but he was, it wasn't angry. It was zeal. He's like, cleanse his temple. Get out of my father's house living this way. Quit doing this in here. This temple is supposed to be a, a house of prayer. It's supposed to be a, a place of worship. And it's not supposed to be a den of thieves. But he wasn't angry. Was he forceful? Was he? Did, did he make a whip? Did, did he get it done? Yeah. It's okay to get it done, but you don't have to be angry. You don't have to be angry at somebody. Even if some, some people always say, "Well, you sound angry." Why? Well, I, I don't. You're hearing it wrong. Then I'm not angry. I'm just adamant about it. I have some zeal about it. I have the spirit of God behind me. It's not anger. It's that simple. Are you angry? No. <laughs> <laughs> just because you hear it and you think it's angry does not mean that somebody's angry. You have to deal with your emotions and your feelings. You can't just assign that to somebody. Oh, because I heard it and I felt like you were angry, then you're angry. Wait a minute. That's not. <laughs> That's some of the, some of the uh, stuff that we see in the media today. I feel like I am, so I am. <laughs> That's not true stuff. So we have to let God sort that out. But he's telling us to take this off. And it's like you're taking off the old man, the old clothing, uh, and you're getting rid of it because you're trying to be renewed according to knowledge of who the image of Christ is. And so you're always, or the image of God is, but he's, God is Christ. Christ is God. And so what are we doing? We're looking to find out what Jesus was like. And the Spirit of God takes the things of God and he presents them to us. And he says, these are not me. You get rid of the anger, the wrath, the malice. The blasphemy, the filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie. Those are things that are not God. So they're not Christ. And so he was not angry because that's not him. Verse 11. Where there is neither, it's renewed in the image of Christ who created him, uh, image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, now we're going to put on, take off first, take off, take off the old person, now we're putting on. Look at, look at verse 12. Put on, what are we supposed to put on? Instead of anger, we have tender mercy. It's the bowels of, of, of mercy. Instead of anger, we want tender mercy. Kindness, which is a fruit of the Spirit. Humility, meekness, long-suffering. Uh, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another... Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Listen, Christ forgave us. 
what could have cast us into hell. And many times we don't forgive somebody just for saying a cross word. We can, we can walk on the other side of the street just when we see them because we're mad at them just for something simple. And God forgave us of sin that could cast us into hell. <clears throat> From a holy and pure God, everybody is unclean. And so he's wanting us to, to die and put on the person of God, the, the, the image of God, the, the life of Christ. Put on the characteristics that can only be done by the Spirit of God. How do we ever put on tender mercy? I, I, I don't know about you guys. I'm not a very merciful person. But I can come to the throne of grace, and as I grow, I'm becoming more merciful. I'm becoming a, a vessel of mercy to other people as I grow in Christ. But I wasn't very, I mean, I see my sin on other people, and I'm like, cast them out, unclean, put them in manacles, you know, and, and we're, we're pointing, but really we see our sin on other people. That's the sin that stands out the most, and we don't even know that when you're pointing, you have three fingers pointing back at yourself, and you should, when you see what somebody else is doing, and you can so clearly call it out, then you should examine your own life and say, why do I see that so clearly, God? And it's because he wants to speak to us about the same sin. What is that? Romans, what chapter is that? Romans 5, if we judge and do the same thing. I don't forget what chapter it is. We're all sinners. We all need tender mercy. We all need God's kindness and and, and uh, his long suffering is one of the things I love because he suffered long for me. That means a long burning wick. Uh, and we do need to forgive. You know, when you forgive somebody, that's when you're forgiving and giving grace and mercy, you're more like Christ than ever in your life because that's the greatest attribute he has is when he forgave me, when he gave me grace and mercy. And then so when I forgive somebody else, I'm being like Christ. And you need the Holy Spirit to help you do that. And when you forgive, uh, it's only saving your own life because if you don't forgive, you're going to become bitter. And it's going to cause you to do things and grieve the Spirit and not live for God. So you have to forgive them to set yourself free. 14. But above all. Uh-oh, here we got an above all. You guys like above all? We're already seeking the things above where Christ is at. And now we get above all things where we do put on love. Remember when it says it, but above all, uh, take up the shield of faith? Yeah, because now we, we, we've got the same writing that Paul writes like this. And now he's like, wait a minute, I was telling you all of that. And above everything, put on what? Love. Agapeo. Which is what? It's the glue. It's the bond. It's what binds us together to perfection. Why? Because God is loving. God is perfect. And the only way to be bound to perfection and be married properly to him <clears throat> is to put on love. Love. And it's an action word. It's where you serve and you give yourself away. You're putting on Christ. And then he says in 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. What's ruling in your hearts? Is there peace in there? Do you know that you're set free? Do you know that you have the peace of God which surpasses all understanding? Can you let the peace of God be the umpire? That's what that means. The umpire of your heart is ruling on all the different things that's going on in your life. These are some difficult things to think about. But this is where we need to be going. This is why, this is why if we were raised with Christ, we should set our mind on uh, things above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God because it's the only way we're going to ever get to this because he's the one that is love. And we need to be seeking his face, knowing our identity, knowing our position, knowing our place, knowing that we need to confess our own uh, uh, sin and confess our own heart before him because until we get right and confess it to him, he doesn't deal with it. You have to, deal, you have to confess it. And sometimes you might, you know, oh, forgive me, Lord, for that. No, no, no. Get before him. Get before him and confess it. Get before him and be real with him. Lord, I know I've confessed this over and over. Lord, I want to deal with it. I want my affections to be set upon you and on heavenly things. But then you have to start to set about doing the natural. Taking off and putting on 
the natural would be, wait a minute, I haven't read my Bible. I haven't been going to prayer. I haven't been going to fellowship. I haven't been going to church. And you begin to put on the other things by doing what you need to be doing. But you can't, you can't walk in the newness of life and continue to walk the same old past, to talk the same old stuff, to read the same old stuff, to watch the same old stuff, to listen to the same old stuff, to hang with the same old people. That's not the newness of life. That's the oldness of death. That's a dead road there. That's a dead bridge. It needs to be burned down, and you don't cross back over it. Uh, 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. What is the umpire of your heart? Is it God's word? Is it his spirit? Is it what he says? Do you feel that you, do you know that you're content in the beloved? To which also you were called in one body. We're all one body. To be thankful, oh wow, and be thankful. And we need to be thankful too, guys. Hey, do you guys see that? We need to be thankful. You guys, you guys doing any, being thankful for anything? Oh, I just grumble and complain. Who's driving the car in front of me? I'm sick of this. I'm good at that. Where did this come from? You call that fast food? That took almost eight minutes. Sick of this. Pay all this money for wait eight minutes for food being thankful that's why I try to tell you guys about the the axe method of praying because it reminds you to do that when you're before God now you might think well that's just like a little gimmick or something no it reminds you to adore him and to confess your sin and then to be thankful before you go asking and supplicating for people you're being thankful then you have to start searching your heart and go what am I thankful for and then you know what? You're not just thankful for the good things. You should be thankful for the bad things too. You need to be thankful for all things. Not thankful that they happen, but be thankful that God uses them to change you. In them, you can be thankful. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ, listen, you have to let this happen. You can't make it happen. You can't put it on or take it off. You just have to surrender to it. And, and dwell in it and you let it let the word of Christ dwell live in you richly that's why I can't figure out when people aren't reading their Bible oh I, I've been there I've been there even as a Christian there's times where you go what is going on I just don't have a desire to read my Bible and you have to say that to God you need to get real with God you say Lord I just don't even have a desire to read my Bible can you give me a desire to read it but then what do you do? You put it on. You pick it up and you start reading it. You just ask him. It's a pretty simple way to, to deal with it. And you start reading it. And, and because it will change your life. Let the word of Christ, just let it dwell in you richly. Oh my goodness. Just let it dwell there. Let it sit on your heart. Let it make its home in your house. Let him kick up his feet on your, on your ottoman. And, um, in all wisdom... So we get our wisdom from the scriptures. Teaching and admonishing, that's the word nutateo. Admonishing means counseling by confrontation. Nutateo. You get the word, it tells you, and you obey it. That's confrontation. Where it confronts you in your sin. Confronts you in your laziness. But look what he says though. Teaching and admonishing one another. It's the one another ministry. As we talk about the word of God. As we rehearse the word of God, we're speaking in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Because we need grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's why we're seeking those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Because that's our inheritance. And so it's God's riches at Christ's expense that we have. It, 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 and that's what's in our hearts. Or should be growing in our hearts. And whatever you do, wonder what that means. Anybody got a calculator? Whatever, is that all? Do it, whatever you do in word or deed, whatever you're saying, whatever you're doing, do all in the name, the character, the nature, the will of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks, there that is again, to God the Father through him. And then he goes on to list the, the different categories of family marriage uh, what we should be doing on the job bond servants he lists all of them it's a lot like over in uh, uh, 
the book of Ephesians. Um, a lot of it is covered in chapter 5. Anyway, what are you seeking? Are you seeking things above or are you still seeking things on the earth? Uh, things above are spiritual. Things on the earth are physical, fleshly, carnal. And we're, we're not to regard anyone as flesh and blood anymore. We're now understand that we're spirits in a body, that we are spirits and everything about our life is a spiritual life, that, that, that God is a spirit and he dwells in us. And that's pretty amazing to me. That he lives in our hearts. I'm like, oh my goodness. You're in there too? <laughs> oh my goodness. And so were those thoughts and those actions. <clears throat> and you're there. Okay, next week, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. It's quite a bit. Quite a bit. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Uh, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good deeds or good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching and the day is approaching all you have to do is look and you can see the day approaching the day of the Lord is coming so Hebrews 10 24 and 25 little more work a little more work this week. So it's going to be a little tougher. Write it out a few times. Carry it in your pocket. We have our phones now. You can have it on your phone. So no matter where you're at, you can pop it up. And it's uh, quite a bit. Father, thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, that um, since we have raised in the newness of life, that we would seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at your right hand. That's the hand of power. And if we want to walk in your power, we must seek your face. So pour out your spirit upon us. Have your way with us, Lord, and give us a desire uh, to set our affections on heavenly things. Set our affections on the work that you've called us to do, Lord, and to stop chasing the deadness of this life stop chasing the things of the flesh and to begin to be led by the Spirit. Pour out your Spirit upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless you.